the strength to follow your commands could never come from me oh father use my ransom life in any way you choose and let my song Jesus is my Good morning, New City. If you're joining us online for the first time, click on the Start Here link and click Connect and fill out a virtual Connect card to let us know that you're here with us and how we can be praying for you. So now let's all stand and hear our call to worship. We have Melanie this morning reading our call to worship from 1 John. 1 John 4, 7-11. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us, and that we have... One second, sorry. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. As we consider love on this third 
Advent Sunday, we see that the greatest act of love in all of history was God sending his son Jesus as the promised Messiah. We didn't love God. In fact, we hated him. Yet he demonstrated his great love for us in making a way to redeem us from our sin and brokenness back to him. The world is dark and the light of the whole world came as a baby born in a stable. First John, that as we have been loved by God in Christ, we should also love others. And in 1 Corinthians 13, we see what love is. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Mm. It's not irritable. It's not resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Love continues even when not returned. 
how good, at we, how good are we at loving people that way? We often fall short. I think many times it's because we don't really understand or trust that we are truly loved by God in that way. I get impatient with my kids or wife because I don't really understand how patient God has been with me and how patient he continues to be with me over and over again. I get anger when somebody sins against me because I easily forget the many ways that I sin against God and he continues to pour grace on me. Let's pray now and confess our failure to trust in God's love for us and to love others as he has loved us. Let's pray together. Father, you demonstrated your great, great love for us by sending Jesus. And we still so often doubt it. We doubt your plan for us. We doubt your goodness. God, would you help our unbelief deepen our faith in who you are and your love for us. Convict us of the many ways that we fail to love others as we've been loved. Make us more like Jesus, who loved us when we were unlovable, even when we hated him. Most of all, God, we pray that as we celebrate this Advent season, our love for our Savior would grow deeper as we consider all that he has done for us through his life, death, and resurrection.
this is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and I will not rebuke you. Read this underlined passage with me. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. This promise made to God's people long before Christ's birth is true for us today. We know this when we look to the cross, Jesus' perfect life, sacrificial death, and overcoming resurrection clearly demonstrates God's perfect love towards us. So we should never doubt. His love will never depart from us. stop pursuing us. Jesus took on flesh as a sign of love, as a sign of your pursuit of us. Father, we are humbled by this this morning as we, as we think about what you have done for us. As we think about this Christmas season, remembering what Christ has done for us. Jesus, 
we are humbled by your sacrifice. Thank you. Thank you for the gift of love. Help us to be renewed and transformed. Help us to love others just as you have loved us. Lead and guide us to opportunities to love and share this good news with them. Continue to speak the truth into us. Continue to speak the gospel into our lives. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Good morning. It's good to see you guys this morning. Welcome to New City. If you are visiting with us, we're really glad to have you with us uh, today. And if you haven't done so, we would love to have you stop by uh, the Connect Bar before you leave and fill out maybe an info card for us. Um, I, I promise we won't harass you and following up, knock on your door unexpected or anything like that. Uh, we will follow up with an email just to see if there's any way that we can serve you or anything that uh, we, can, we can do for you, any way we can help you. And in, in exchange for that, we have a small gift, just our way of saying thank you for being with us. Uh, and it is the world's greatest coffee mug uh, with the New City label on it. And even if you're not going to make New City your home, we would really love to send you home with one of those uh, so that when you do drink out of the coffee mug, maybe you'll remember New City Church and pray for us. And because we got a card from you, we will pray for you as well. So again, welcome. Ho hopefully you guys got one of these when you came in today. Um, just a couple of things I want to remind you of. One is our new city class that we have uh, at the end of every month. That's for anyone who's interested in becoming a partner of New City. That's what we call our members. Uh, that class is required. Um, and if you're just interested in learning more about who New City is and what we do, then that class would be for you as well. Um, you can meet our some of our staff and elders and uh, learn more about New City and ask whatever questions you might have of them. The other is our Christmas Eve service. We are um, hoping, uh, as of right now, we are planning on having our Christmas Eve service as usual, and that'll be at 5.30. Um, it, it will uh, be a little different than years past because we will be socially distanced. Uh, and so normally it is a pretty full house. Um, we need you to register if you're going to spend Christmas Eve with us, just so that we know that we have space for everyone. Um, so again, we're going to take the same measures and precautions that we do now um, for Christmas Eve. Come, uh, bring your family, it will be a good night, but make sure that you register. Uh, that's good enough for now. So we are in week three of our Advent um, series, and this week we are... I'm um, going to continue the Christmas story, of course, and I want to start just by reading from Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to, make, uh, to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So the, the previous couple of weeks, uh, we have looked at the, the lineage of Jesus and particularly how the lineage um, shows us the faithful of faithfulness of God through history uh, and in bringing Jesus. We looked last week at the hope, or rather the joy, uh, that God's people looked forward to and all the centuries of, of waiting for the appearance uh, of joy and how that joy came at the birth of Jesus. And this week, we're going to talk more about the birth itself. And this birth was no ordinary birth. In, in theological terms, it's uh, what we call the incarnation. Um, this was the sign, as we just read from Isaiah 7, 14. Uh, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, the prophet 
uh, spoke of him and said this, he will be born of a virgin and he shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. John said it this way when we talk about this birth and God being with us. In John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. The life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, uh, the second person of our triune God, took on the flesh of humanity and dwelt among us. I think that we hear that so much like, like other things when it comes to our faith that, that we sort of take it for granted and don't give it much thought. This is God himself in the Son coming to live with his creation. God taking on the flesh of humanity and being born as a, as a, as a helpless baby. Emmanuel, God with us, God come to rescue his people. That is amazing, and it's, it's, it's really more than amazing. It, it, it's, it's almost too much for us really to comprehend that God would take on flesh, that, that God himself would come to his fallen creation to redeem us, to restore everything as he intended it to be. The question then becomes why? Why would God do that? Why, why, would, why would God come in the second person and take on the flesh of humanity, being born as a baby? Why, why would the Father send the Son? Why would He send the Son to be born in, in a stall with animals? Why would the Father send His Son to live a life of poverty, humiliation, suffering, and ultimately separation and such a terrible, terrible death? Why would He do that? What motivated Christmas? That's really what I'm asking is what motivated Christmas? And the answer for what motivated Christmas in, in one sense is easy for us to understand, but so hard for us to believe. So I want us to pray together this morning as we talk about the motivation for Christmas. I, I ask again, as I do every week, if you would pray with me. Um, Pray, pray for yourself, pray for those around you that, that we would be in, encouraged by this truth. And, and more than that, I, I don't really know how to verbalize this rightly, but that we would truly believe the thing that we're talking about and this thing that we profess and, and, and this truth of, of God, that we would not just know it mentally giving assent to it, but that we would believe it with all of our heart. So, so pray that God would do a, a good work among us that we would truly and deeply believe this morning. Will you pray with me? Yeah, let's pray together then. Father, we come together this morning um, thankful, thankful that we can come together. We're thankful for this season. We're thankful even though weary and, um, and many hurting, we come together thankful. We are celebrating the birth of Jesus, our Savior. So I pray this morning that you would be good, that your Holy Spirit would open our ears and our eyes, that our, our heart would, would receive the truth of your word this morning. Father, even as I pray that, I, I know that what I'm going to say is not going to be new to most people. Father, help us to truly believe it, not just to know it, to say we know it is truth, to even be able to say it to other people, but help, help us, help me to truly believe this morning. You are good to us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thankfully, we don't have to go very far when we ask the question of why for, for Christmas what, what motivated God in, in sending His Son and what motivated the Son to come. In fact, it's probably one of the most familiar passages in all of the Bible um, that, that, that gives us the answer. It's John 3.16. 
Uh, and so what I want us to do this morning, because we're probably all familiar with it, is just to, to read John 3.16 together like we would our responsive reading. So um, John 3.16, yep, we got it. So y'all read this with me. For, okay, stop. I tricked you. Um, but I wanted you to start with me this morning. Um, the, 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 the thing is, we, we read this, for God so loved the world, but, but I wanted us to stop because this word for um, has a meaning, and, and it gives us the answer. The word for is there, and, it, and what it means is because. And so really, what, what we're getting in John 3.16 3, is the answer to the question of what was the motivation for Christmas, and why would God send His Son, and why would the Son come so willingly? It is because... And so if we have this with the word because, I want us to to read John 3.16 together, as I said, but I want us to read it with the word because instead of the word for. So can you all do that with me? Trust me, I'm going to do the whole thing this time. Okay, let's do this. One, two, three. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life because I mean that's that's our answer right there why did God send the son why did the son come because God so loved the world God so loved the world that is the motivation Uh, God's love for us God's love for us God's love for me God's love for you Christmas is the incarnation and, and birth of that love in the flesh of Jesus, right? And this is the incarnation. This is God taking on flesh. This is love. If God is love, this is love taking on flesh. So Christmas is the beautiful expression of God's love toward us. When we want to see what love is, to know what love is, we really don't have to look much further than Christmas. Christmas is the incarnation of His love. The beautiful expression of his love for us. So what I want to do is, I know that we've heard that before. I want us to talk about a couple of aspects of that love and and just sort of unpack what it means when we say that God so loved the world and that God loves us. So, So first of all, Christmas is the beautiful expression of God's unconditional love toward us. God's unconditional love toward us. If I am honest, and I will be honest with you this morning, um, I, I, I would and I will, I do admit that sometimes, and I hate to say it, but if I'm being honest, often it seems that my love is conditional. Confession. I tell you guys all the time that I, God works on me during the week and then you just get to sit in on it on Sundays same is true here. When I think about love and, 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 and my love, my love is often conditional. Um, I don't think that I am alone here. Uh, I, I think we all probably struggle with this. I love the most when I receive the most, right? When, when people give love to me, when people show kindness to me, um, when, when people are good to me, when people are merciful for me, when people make it really easy for me, then I am more likely to show and, and, and to give my love to other people. The person who cuts me off in traffic, different story, right? It's a little bit harder for me to love them when they have cut me off in traffic. I, I find that I have the most difficulty in giving love to someone else when they stand opposed to me, when, when maybe they say things about me that aren't nice and it feels like they are against me or, or they are my enemies, um, when, 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 it's, when it's that way, then if I'm honest, there's not much love at all for that person. Yes, I am the lead pastor at New City Church, just expressing my own weaknesses. The truth is, I feel fairly comfortable in sharing those this morning because I don't really think I'm alone. I, I, I think that if you were honest with yourselves and honest with the rest of us, you would say that that's the way your love flows as well. It gets worse. At least for me, it gets worse. 
When I think about myself, when I think about my thoughts, when I think about my, my actions, when I think about, uh, about the real me, and I think about the love that God has for me, again, being honest, I, I am really not so lovable. I am really not very lovable, and that's the truth. Really, the Bible confirms this as well that I'm not so lovable. I do the things that I'm not supposed to do. The things that I know that I am supposed to do, I often don't do those things. When I do do some of those things, I do it grudgingly, and I don't always have the best attitude about the things that I'm doing. I, 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 I try and think that somehow I can hide things from God. Sometimes I even try to hide myself from God. I, I hurt others sometimes in the way that I respond or the way that I react. Being completely honest, I can be a very self-centered person. Sometimes, sometimes I am self-righteous. I can be judgmental. Y'all are beginning to agree, aren't you? I'm a pretty rotten person. <laughs> I really am a mess. But so are you. And again, the reason that I feel comfortable enough to stand here and confess, confess that I am not so lovable is because I know that the truth is, neither are you. We really are a mess. And yet, in all of the mess that we are, God loves us. In all of the mess that you are, in all of the mess that I am, God, God loves us. And his love is, is not conditioned on our behavior. He, he, he doesn't love us because we do him good. He, he doesn't love us because we are good. He doesn't love us because we're the nicest people, the kindest people, because we respond the right way all of the time. He doesn't love us because he sees us as incredibly compassionate and helpful. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't love us because of anything that we can bring to him. And, and, and even more beautiful, he doesn't wait on us to do that. Like, like he's not looking out into the future and saying, that Keith, one day he's going to be an amazing guy. I mean, he knows the beginning from the end, and he knows that all the way to the end, until the day I'm redeemed, I'm not going to be a very great guy. Not on my own. And yet he doesn't wait. He doesn't wait on me to get it all together. He doesn't wait on me to become the kindest person or the most considerate person before he loves me. He simply loves me, and he simply loves you without condition. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love that He has for us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Grace means unmerited, an unmerited gift. Your salvation, His love, is completely unmerited. God comes to us while we are sinners and he freely gives us not just this gift of salvation, but the, the beautiful gift of his love. 1 John 4, 9 through 11 says, In this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. One more, Romans 5, 6 through 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I am glad that God is not like me. You can say amen. <laughs> it is good that God is not like me. That his love and his goodness are poured out on us, on me, on, on you unconditionally. Even now, he loves me. With all that I've confessed to you this morning, my father still loves me. 
having become his child. I, 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 didn't, I didn't earn his affection to begin with. I didn't do anything to earn his love to, to be made a child. And, and, and now, even as his child, I still do nothing to maintain it. Christmas is the beautiful expression of that love poured out on me and on you. It is a beautiful expression of God's unconditional love toward us. And Christmas is the beautiful expression of God's unrelenting love toward us. Right? In, in love, God pursues us. God pursues you. He, he, he is pursuing us continually in order to win us in order to keep us, in order to have us walk with Him. His pursuit of us is relentless. It will not be stopped. The story of the Bible really gives us a glimpse of that relentless pursuit from God. We go through the creation, fall, redemption, restoration narrative, right? God created and everything was good. He walked with his people. He loved his people. He, he came in the cool of day and he spent time with Adam and Eve every day. He was their God and they were his people and he would love and care for them. And everything, everything was good when he created. In fact, God said, looking at creation after Adam and Eve, it's all very good. And it was very good for a couple of chapters, right? And then sin entered into the world and, and sin changed everything. Sin changed everything. Suddenly, instead of enjoying the relationship that they had with God, Adam and Eve are, are, are trying to justify their behavior, blaming one another, blaming God, hiding from one another, hiding from God. All of the things that we do now, they did as soon as sin entered into the world. That would be the pattern for all of humanity, and we see it unfold in the Bible. But God was not satisfied with the fall. God was not satisfied that humanity would be separated from him. So as early as Genesis 3.15, God promised a Redeemer. He would send a Redeemer, one who would come and fix all that is broken. All of the brokenness would be mended, and He would redeem His people from their sin. And His goal in all of it would be restoration, restoring all of creation to what He intended it to be in the very beginning. And the earth would be filled with His image bearers. And He would be their God, and they would be His people. He would walk with them. And that relationship would be there. This was God's desire. And the Bible tells us that, that his pursuit has been relentless. And it will be relentless until the end, the consummation of all things. Incredible. God's unrelenting pursuit of us. The book of Hosea. I love the book of Hosea. If you haven't read it, Read the book of Hosea. It is, um, it's a true life story. This, this really happened, and, and it, was a, it was a story played out with a prophet's life. His life became a, a dramatic picture of God's relentless pursuit of his people. In, in the book of Hosea, Hosea, the prophet, is God or, or represents God. And Gomer, his wife, represents Israel, re represents us. And in the story, Gomer is a prostitute. Gomer is a prostitute that, that, that Hosea marries and makes his wife. And, 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 and the, the, the idea of the prostitute is what God is saying, this is how I see Israel. Israel, whom I've loved, Israel, who I've, I've taken and made mine, Israel, whom I've provided for and given to. And over and over again, Israel would leave God to follow other gods like a prostitute. We, in the story of Hosea, we are, we are Israel, we are Gomer, seeking fulfillment in other places, worshiping other gods. And in the book, Hosea marries Gomer, gives her a great life, but she is restless. And over and over again, he finds out that she has been cheating. And finally, one day, she leaves him and says, that's it. I'm gone. I'm never coming back. I've found another man, and, and, and I will stay with him. But, but he's not satisfied with that, just as God isn't satisfied to be separated from us. And he pursues her. He finds her. He finds his cheating wife. His adulterous wife, he finds her and, and he, brings her, he brings her home. He brings her home to love her and to care for her and to accept her and to once again have her as his wife. 
And the whole point of it is that's the picture of God pursuing Israel, and that's the picture of God pursuing us. He is relentless in his pursuit. And as, as often as she failed, as often as we fail, God's pursuit will not fail. Again and again, he calls us to himself, and again and again, he welcomes us home. Romans 8, 31 and following tells it beautifully when it comes to this love. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. No, no tribulation, no distress, no persecution, no famine, no nakedness, no danger, no sword. Not death, not life, not angels, not rulers. Nothing present, nothing to come, nothing in our past. No power, no height, no depth, nothing, 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 nothing can separate us from His love. Nothing, nothing, nothing can stop his unrelenting love for you and for me. That rocks my socks. I mean, that's good. That is good stuff. And, and that's, that's what I need. I, 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 I need God to be unconditional in his love because I will never meet the conditions. I need for him to be relentless because I'm like Hosea and I'm constantly wandering and and straying away like Gomer. And that's Christmas. Because God so loved, he sent his son. This is good news, right? This is the good news of the gospel. and, And it is good news that when we understand it, it changes everything. Let me say that differently. We, we talk about gospel transformation at New City, how the gospel transforms us. And, and, and here's, here, here's what, I'm, what I'm saying is not that, we, not that we understand it intellectually, not that we know it as some knowledge that's filed away like our eighth grade math. That we know it deeply and intimately and personally and we cling to it as the truth that it is, that we believe with all that we are. When we believe that God loves us with that kind of love, when we we truly believe that God loves us in that way, it changes everything. Everything is changed. I want to move from from those truths to how we would apply them and and how it is that our life has changed when we truly believe them. The unconditional and unrelenting love of God frees us. God's love frees us. Christmas. Christmas itself is a gift that, that, that frees us when, when we can truly grasp, when, when we can truly believe with our heart this gift that we have in Christmas. It, it, it frees us from the bondage of works. This is how it frees us. It, it frees us, this love, from the bondage of works. There is in all of us a desire to be loved and accepted. All of us have that. We all desire to be loved and accepted, and there's nothing wrong with that. I believe that God innately gave that to us. The problem is not that we desire to be loved and accepted. The problem is that in our brokenness, we, we become a slave to always trying to earn love. And we're always looking for love in, in all of the wrong places. We try to earn love from other people. 
We even try to earn love from God, right? Like obeying all the rules, being nice, being good people. If we can be good enough, if we can do the right things, then God will love us and and then he'll pour out his blessings and our life will be good. And so we are trying to earn God's love. Obeying the rules, doing the right things, acting like we're always happy, acting like we've got our life together. Maybe we read the Bible. Maybe we come to church because it's a duty that we have in order for God to love us. We do for other people. We're nice for other people. We give to other people. We serve other people because really what we're looking for is for other people to love us. And, and if, we, if we give the right gift, if we do the right things, if we say the right things, if, we, if we've done enough, then maybe, maybe they will love us. Wouldn't it be great if none of that mattered? Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be great to be loved even if you failed? Wouldn't it be great to, to, to be loved no matter, no matter how terribly you failed wouldn't it be amazing to be accepted even with all of your hidden uglies or we all have those hidden uglies wouldn't it be absolutely amazing to be fully known to be fully known with 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 all of our uglies with all of our problems with all of the things that go on with us to to be fully known all of those fully known and and still to be loved the love of God that's the way that God loves us we are we are fully known with all that is ugly about us we are fully known in every one of our failings and there's no way that we can hide it and yet as he fully knows us still he fully loves us no conditions and his pursuit is relentless Nothing that you could do to earn that love. You didn't earn it to begin with, so you know you 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 don't need to hide any longer. He loved you then, and he loves you now. Nothing, nothing, nothing that you could do in your life will separate you from his love for you. You don't have to work for it. You can be free from that. Related to that, at New City, we often talk about the two places that bondage to works lead us. And I want to hit these pretty quickly, but, but one, it frees us from religious pride. Some of us look at our good works and we think pretty highly of ourselves. We, we, we do good things, we do a lot of good things, we forget about the bad things that we do, and, and then we compare ourselves with other people, Right? And when we do compare ourselves with other people, we compare ourselves with people that we can look at and see clearly they don't have their life together. And so we feel good about ourselves. Look at how good I am. Look at how holy that I am. God loves me because I am good. God loves me. I've got this all figured out. I am doing the right things. I know all the right things. God loves me. And I am accepted because I am so, so good. He definitely loves me more than he loves you because look at how messed up you are. Stop comparing yourself to other people. Here's the truth. When it comes to our righteousness, the people around us are not our standard. Jesus is the standard, right? So until your righteousness can meet the righteousness of Jesus then there really is no room for self-righteousness. The truth is, it isn't about you. It shouldn't be about you. God never meant for it to be about you in in, in that way. It's not about how great you are. It really is about how great He is. That in spite of all your failings, He would still love you. So grasping his love for you frees you from self-righteousness. You don't have to be self-righteous. You you don't have to earn it. Jesus has earned it for you. It frees us from self-righteousness and religious pride, and it also frees us from despair. So, So while some people compare themselves to others and say, look how great I am because those people stink, Others of us look at other people and compare ourselves to other people and say, man, they've got their life together and I stink and that leads to despair. 
I, I despair because as hard as I try, as much as I do, I always mess up, and therefore I will never measure up. And I, I look at the people around me, and it looks like they have a great life, and they're doing everything right, and, and, and they, are the, they are the example of a Christian, and here I am, a failure. Despair, shame, and depression. If that's you, I want you to hear me this morning. I know that it is hard for you, but you are loved just like you are. You are loved just like you are. God loves you with all of your shortcomings, with all of your failures. God will work in you and he will work with you to shape you into the, G into the image of Jesus more and more. But, but he loves you right now. As bad as your morning was, as bad as yesterday or last night was, or whatever it was, He loves you. He loves you at your best. He loves you at your worst. That's what unconditional love means. It means you're loved. It means you are accepted. Not because you have met this list of great expectations or because you have given enough or done enough, but, but simply because He chose to love you. He loves you. And you can't stop His love. Not only does grasping this deep and incredible love free us from the bondage uh, of works, right, which, which leads to freedom from self-righteousness or despair, but this love frees us from the bondage of anxiety. It frees us from the bondage of anxiety. Good and perfect love always wants what is best for the object that is loved, and, and God is good and perfect. A, a good father, a good father, a, a good and loving, perfect father, or, or let me say it this way, a good and perfect father loves his children. And when a father loves his children, he, he wants to provide for their needs. He does what is necessary to provide for their needs. A, a, a good and loving father cares for his children. He, he, he wants what is, what is best for their well-being. He wants what, what brings them joy. He wants to see his children filled with joy. He wants to protect them from, from any harm. Those are all the things that, that, that cause us anxiety. Like, 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 what will we do for money? What will we do for money or, or for, for food or for clothing? What, what, what will we do to secure our future? How can we protect ourselves from harm? How, these are the things that cause us anxiety. How can we protect the people around us who we love? How can we protect them from, from mistakes in their life and things that will bring them harm? How can I protect my family? How can I protect myself? How can I make sure that my future is safe and secure? can't. God does that. God does that and he does it perfectly because he is perfect. God does that and he does it right every time because he is a good and perfect loving father. In love he wants all of those things for you even when you don't understand. Here's the thing, because he is God, he is able because he is God, he is able to do all of those things that you are unable to do. We don't have to worry when we, when we know. If it is true that, that God loves us with this kind of love, then we don't have to worry. We don't have to be anxious. We, we, we can lean into the loving and gracious and sovereign and, and all-powerful arms of our good and loving Father. That's what it means to believe you are loved. See, we, we, we know the truth that God loves us. This is what it means to believe that you are loved. One more, this, this love frees us to love others. When we realize that we are loved and accepted fully and wholly by God and, and that, that God in love will care for us, that he will protect us, that he will provide for us, we, we, we find that we don't have to have all of those things from other people. We don't have to depend on others for all of those things. We don't have to defend ourselves for those things. We don't have to work for those things. 
We don't do then in order to receive from others. We don't do for others so that they will do for us. We don't love others because of what others will give us. Everything that we need is is graciously given to us from our Father who is good and loving and perfect. And and so I, I don't need from you what the Father will give me. I don't have to work to to make you happy with me because because the Father who loves me loves me. I I don't have to be accepted by you because I am accepted by Him. I don't have to be loved. My, my, my life doesn't depend on whether you love me or not because I am loved by my Father. And what that frees me up to do is to love my enemies. I don't need anything. It's okay if you're against me. It's okay if you hate me because you know what? My, my, my Father loves me. My Father is for me. I don't need to do things so that you will do things for me. I'm free from that because my Father is going to give me everything that I need. So I can give to you just because I love you as I am loved. Expecting absolutely nothing in return. I am loved and accepted by the creator and the sustainer of the universe. But by the most awesome, most powerful, most amazing king of all kings. What, what love does anyone else have to offer me in comparison with his love? So I'm free. I'm free to love and not be loved back. I'm free to love away even when that love isn't reciprocated. I can love because I am freely loved. So when we get this amazing love of God, this unconditional, unrelenting love for us, we are, we are free from the bondage of works, free from self-righteousness, free from despair, free from anxiety, free to love others without fear. But here's the thing, I don't think that most of us live in our daily life believing this thing that we say we know. We struggle. Sometimes we believe it in other people. Like it's easy for me to believe that God loves you like that, but sometimes it's hard to believe that God would love me that way. And when we don't believe it, or, or when we believe that way, then, then what we end up doing is we don't live in freedom, we live in bondage, and we continue to work, working to earn His love, working to earn the love of others, because we don't freely receive His love. We worry and we are anxious about the things that He said that He would take care of. We, we, we struggle to love others or, or to be loved. So, so how do we move then from, from knowing to believing, to living as if this is reality. Maybe you're here this morning as an unbeliever, someone who's never really trusted in Jesus, in his life, in his death, his resurrection. You start there. This is the gift of of Christmas, that in love the Father sent the Son, and in love the Son came. He, he lived the life that you can't live. He died the death that you deserve because of sin. He was raised on the third day to give you new life. Trust in that good news of the gospel, and in believing, your sins are forgiven, wiped clean. You are free from that, redeemed from sin, and made a child of God. Start there. Believer, you have to hear this truth over and over and over and over again. So easy to forget. So easy to forget. You need to be here or somewhere, somewhere that you hear the love of God and the gospel proclaimed to you over and over and over again so that you don't forget. More than being here, I'm I'm glad that you're here, I love that you're here, you need to be a part of a missional community. If you're at New City, you need to be a part of a missional community. That's our small groups that meet in homes during the week. You need to be there so that you can be close to people who will tell you this good news, who will remind you when you forget the good news of the love of God for you. You need to be with people who will love you and preach this gospel to you. And you need to preach this gospel to yourself. 
You, you, need, to, you need to listen to, to, to preachers who proclaim the gospel. You need to listen to music that proclaims the gospel. You need to be reminded again and again and again of these simple truths of the gospel that you have forgotten. It's not that you don't know them. It's that you stopped believing them. You need to be called back again and again and again to believe. Pray. Pray that God would help you. Pray that God would, would, would help you move from, from simply giving mental assent to these truths to, to clinging to them as though your life depended on it. Pray that He would, would help you understand in your heart and, and, and truly believe how loved that you are. Unconditionally, relentlessly loved. And when you doubt, hear this, when you doubt because you will doubt, when you doubt as we all do, when you, when you doubt His relentless love for you, when you doubt His unconditional love for you, when you doubt that there is any way possible that God could love anyone like you, or, or, or that He would love you enough to provide for all of your needs, that he would, he would give to you, that He would protect you, that He would care for you, when you feel overwhelmed with the weight of loneliness, because others have not met your need for love, remember Christmas. It's not just words. R remember the Son who left His place in heaven to take on the flesh of a baby born in a stable. Remember the gift of a father who, who loved you so in, unconditionally while you were yet sinners. Re remember the love, his relentless love pursuing you. The love that would give his son to gain you. Remember how nothing would stop him. This is Christmas. God's unconditional, unrelenting love. Incarnate. A beautiful expression of His love toward you. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for, uh, for a reminder of this truth and the beautiful love that You have for us. It is sometimes too much to grasp that you would love people like us and that you would love us so much that you would send your son is too much to grasp so father i pray that you would help us i pray holy spirit that you would help us that you would remind us again and again and again of this great love for us i pray that our hearts would be would be softened i pray that our eyes would be opened I pray that these wouldn't just be words that we can recite or, or knowledge that we file away somewhere, but it would become a truth. That your love would be rooted deeply, deeply, deeply in our hearts. And that it would be the place that we go to again and again and again. Help us. Father, we thank you again. We thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for Jesus who loved us and still loves us. We thank you that today we, we, in Christ, by faith, are children. We thank you that you are a good, good, loving Father. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close out this morning, uh, we'll close out as we usually do at New City with communion and a couple of songs. If you are not a member of New City, um, we practice open communion, and that means you are welcome to join us in communion. We have individual packets. If you didn't get one when you came in at the door, coming into the sanctuary and upstairs at the top of the steps, you are welcome to go and grab one of those. As we sing this first song, take a minute. If the Holy Spirit has um, convicted you of anything in your life where you have lacked belief, maybe, in the way that you are loved, um, whatever it is, Repent. That means turn from that and turn by faith to God. To believe. To believe in who He is. To believe in what He's done. To believe in this beautiful message of Christmas. Return to Him like Gomer and Hosea. And, and be met with open and loving arms.
Communion is a reminder for us of Christmas, of the birth of Jesus, the gift that we have, of the life that he lived for us, the death that he died for us, and his resurrection. In him, through faith, we are made children of God. So take this morning. The bread represents his body given for us. The juice represents his blood shed for us. In that, we are made children of God. Would you stand this morning? chapter 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that you might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. God gave us his Holy Spirit as a sign of our adoption. We're children of God, and the Spirit reminds us of who we are as loved children and enables us to love others as we've been called to do. So let's sing now of the wondrous love of God shown so clearly to us in Jesus. love is this oh my soul oh my soul what wondrous love is this oh my soul what wondrous love is this that caused the lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul for my soul to bear the dreadful curse 
time for many of us, but for some, they're the loneliest and even most hopeless time of year. The love of God is an incredible gift that we should always be ready to share, especially with those hurting all around us. So as you go, keep your eyes open this week, looking for opportunities to show love to people you encounter, but most of all, to share the good news of the redeeming love that was shown to us in the gospel. New City Church, you are sent. <laughs>